I'm Mr. Mega Man Fan, and today's feature is called How to Jailbreak Your Analog Mini NT Noir. Step 1 You're going to need an SD card. It can be a micro SD card as long as it comes with the SD card adapter. I recommend a name brand. I chose Samsung for this purpose. Step 2 is you're going to have to reformat this bad boy to FAT32. If, like me, your computer doesn't have any SD or micro SD card slots, use a USB adapter and plug it in, then plug it into the USB port, as you have seen me do here. Step 3 is pulling up the GitHub page with the jailbreak. I'll put a link in the description of this video, and as it notes on the GitHub page, FAT16 and XFAT are not supported, and mine came as XFAT by default, so reformatting it was necessary, but it's also a good idea when you're starting out a new project to format it the first time just to make sure it's in the correct orientation you want. I'm a Mac OS guy, so I'm using Disk Utility to do this, but if you're on a Windows PC, you should be able to right click on the drive in either your computer or on your desktop and select to format it. And don't worry if it says FAT and not FAT32. If you format it for MS-DOS FAT, it will be FAT32 by default, unless you're using a disk formatting utility of some kind. And as long as we're formatting it, let's give it a name that makes it appropriate for what we're using. I'm going to title it NOIR for the Analog Jailbreak Noir, so that we know what it's for when it's done formatting. Your next step is going to be downloading the firmware update and placing it on the root directory of the drive you just formatted. And don't worry, you cannot brick the Analog NT Mini Noir. The worst thing you could possibly do is have to go back to the default firmware. You won't cause any damage unless you power off while you're in the middle of updating the firmware, which you should never do on any device anyway. But put this file in the root directory and then you're going to put it into your Analog Mini NT Noir version 2 while it's powered off. Please make sure it's powered off before you put it in there. Once you turn it on, it'll start updating automatically, but this may take several minutes and the LED will be flashing the whole time. As Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says, don't panic. It will just finish updating on its own and reboot the analog when it's done. So. All you have to do is wait for the light to stop flashing and turn green. Let me show you how that looks. Once your analog has rebooted, you'll notice a new menu option called Cores, but you're not ready to start playing anything just yet. You're going to need to add some BIOS files to the folder and you're going to need to delete that firmware update from the folder. And when you do that, you'll be ready to use all of these various systems on your newly jailbroken Analog Mini NT Noir version 2. To simplify things, the GitHub page has included a bunch of file folders for all of your ROMs and for the BIOSes. So download SD card system structure version JB 6.6 .6 after you delete the firmware. Once you do that, you can simply unzip the folder and dump the entire contents into the root directory of the SD card you're using in the analog. You could, of course, do this manually and create one folder at a time by yourself, but all of the file associations that the analog will be looking for in this jailbreak are in these folder directories, so you might as well use the folders provided and save yourself a whole lot of hassle. One note before we continue, and it's a feature I won't be showing off in today's video, but one of the best reasons to jailbreak your analog is for the Copy NES Mini, so you can dump your own NES and Famicom card, and it will save your dumps directly to the SD card in a Copy NES folder, so then you can use them on your jailbroken analog, or on your EverDrive NA Pro, or on any emulator you like. You can dump your own cards and play them to your heart's content. As for the BIOSes, or operating systems, of these various game consoles, you don't need to find and download all of them, you only need to get the ones you're actually going to use, such as Sega Master System, Atari 7800, etc. and so on. Download the ones that you're going to use, and put them in the BIOS folder in the root directory of your SD card. Follow the file naming format that's listed in the GitHub. Even if you download a bin, and it looks ready to go, 
make sure that the file name of that bin matches what's on the GitHub page or it won't work when you try to boot up the games. All of this may seem a little overwhelming at first, but once you've done it and set up your SD card the way you like, it just automatically works. Smooth as butter. Every time you select a core, it takes a few seconds to reconfigure the analog to that particular system, but it can do this at will. It just is a few seconds each time to switch from one game system to the other. And since you can go back to the menu at any time, you can get out of any game you're playing and go to a different game or go to a different console altogether and play games for that console instead. Now obviously it would be impossible for me to show off every game on every console in one video like this, but I thought I could go over a few highlights of each of the different cores, going first from Atari 2600 to Atari 7800, and it works flawlessly. Joust is one of my favorite games on the 7800 and one of my favorite conversions of Joust other than playing a straight up one-to-one -one arcade port, which there are plenty of versions of out there on various Midway compilations that have been released for classic game systems and even more modern game systems over the years. So it's not hard to play a good game of Joust, but this is one of the best versions from back in the day before such compilations were readily available to everyone. I highly recommend Atari 7800 Joust. I also highly recommend any of these cores because they were all designed by Kevtris, the mad scientist behind all of the cores that power the analog consoles, the Analog NT Mini Noir version 2, the Analog Super NT, the Analog Mega SG, so on and so forth. If you want to know how good he is at creating these cores, go look at any of the interviews he's done with channels like My Life in Gaming, and you will see that he strives for a high degree of accuracy in using FPGA to reproduce the original hardware inside of these classic consoles. That's why analog is so appreciated among the retro gaming crowd, because if you own an analog system, you can use the original cartridges, but they will display in high definition instead of the old RF or composite connections that you may have had before then. It's really wacky to me that he managed to put a Sega Genesis core onto this system. I was already using a Genesis core on the Analog Mega SG, but now I can play Genesis games on my NES console too. That should show you how powerful this FPGA is inside of the Analog NT Mini Noir version too. I don't know if the original NT Mini was capable. I don't know if it had this powerful of an FPGA, but I know that there is also a jailbreak for that one as well, so I'm sure there are a lot of cores that are supported, even if Sega Genesis isn't one of them, but it's a weird feeling using the 8 NES controller when you're playing a Sega Genesis game, or a Game Gear game for that matter. Obviously, if Sega Master System games work, Game Gear games would work as well. And again, that's something you can do with your Analog Mega SG, either using the card adapters that are sold by Analog or jailbreaking your Mega SG and loading the ROMs off an SD card, you can play Game Gear games and Sega Master System games that way as well. One of the other cores that's supported by the Mega SG jailbreak is ColecoVision, and that is also included in this set for the NT Mini Noir. I only loaded one game into it to play, but Centipede seems like a damn good choice because again, when I say that there are good versions of games on classic consoles, this is like Joust for Atari 7800. It's simply one of the best home versions of Centipede you can play, especially for back in the era when it was released, and I actually played it for a lot longer than in the footage you're being shown here for this demonstration. I may release another video later with my uncut footage of how long I spent playing each of these cores and the various games within them. But it's nice to see ColecoVision is supported on this one, as well as on the Mega SG. That gives you a lot of flexibility. Game Boy is another core that's supported. You will need to download the BIOS files for Game Boy and for Game Boy Color if you want to play those, but it works flawlessly. I know a lot of people have noted that Castlevania Adventure is really slow compared to classic Castlevania games on NES, Genesis, etc., but to me, growing up, 
I didn't have anything better. I had a Game Boy, I had Castlevania Adventure, and this to me was everything that I wanted it to be given I didn't have any other choice. And the soundtrack for that game is in my view fantastic, one of the best on the platform. And Pokemon Pinball on Game Boy Color is one of the best versions of that you can play as well. Now there's Pokemon Pinball on Game Boy Advance and I enjoy that one a lot too. But this to me is the classic. This is the one that gave me the love for Pokemon Pinball in the first place. You know, I think this is a franchise they could bring back. If they can bring back Pokemon Snap, they could bring back Pokemon Pinball as well. Unfortunately, I must have misnamed the BIOS files for the Intellivision Core, because none of the Intellivision games would boot up when I tried, so I'll have to revisit that core at a later date, but that's why it's important to name your BIOS files carefully. There are some wacky systems on here as well. If you've never played the Entex, it is a red LED based video game console that had interchangeable cartridges. It was not a very big success on the market. Complete in box editions are super rare. Even loose editions are very hard to come by. I don't own one, but now I can play Defender in red LED thanks to this Kevtris core. There are some old school consoles that are also increasingly rare and hard to find. I've never owned an Arcadia and I'm not sure I would want to add one to my collection at this point because some things are just so rare that you don't know if they could be repaired, so fragile that you might not even want to touch them. This is why emulation is important because you can play things like these Arcadia games thanks to Kevtris and play them accurately the way they would have run on an original Emerson Arcadia if you had one that was still working now in the present day. And there are some really obscure systems on here as well. This was one that I had never heard of. It's called the Creative Vision, and apparently it was only sold in European and Asian territories. Don't know that this system ever came to the US unless someone imported it, but it seems like it's a pretty decent console so I'll probably dig into this library a little more and we've got some weird handheld systems on here as well such as the Gamate or I believe it was also called the Cougar Boy. Now this isn't the one that they actually gave away as a prize on the Price is Right that was the Watara Vision but you'll notice that with systems like these they all are very much ripping off what Nintendo was doing at the time with Game Boy. They were all trying to cash in on that exact same market with almost identical chipsets, very low powered, black and white monochrome graphics, long battery life, but Nintendo had the brand recognition and the third party support to easily knock any of these out of the water. Now, the Odyssey 2 core seems to be working just fine here, but I must have configured something wrong because I couldn't move my Munchkin in KC Munchkin. He just sat there in the center the entire time. So I'll have to go back in and mess around with this core a little bit to get it configured properly. Here's another wacky system that was trying to compete with the Game Boy. This one's called the Mega Duck. Oh man, everybody wanted a piece of that Game Boy action. This one, you appear to be some sort of bear throwing blocks at other blocks that are moving towards you, and you want to create perfect squares with those blocks, and once they are filled in, they disappear, and you can move on to the next set of blocks. And if you want them to scroll at you faster, you just hold right, and they come zooming towards you as fast as you can handle. It's not a bad game, and I imagine if you made a Game Boy version of this, it would probably be just as fun as playing it on the Game Duck. I think there's a Game Gear or a Game Boy game that's very similar to that. And of course, you can use the NES Core on your NT Mini Noir, and then you don't even have to load cartridges. You can just play them straight off the ROMs on your SD card, which is why I say it's so valuable that Copy NES is included here, because you can just... Dump your own games using Copy NES, keep them on the SD card, and then play the ROMs and preserve your cartridges for the future. 
Not that I think most NES cartridges are going to wear out. Mine all still work, especially if I give them a nice thorough cleaning first. But it's nice to have the option. I'm Mr. Mega Man fan. Thank you for watching. And be sure to try jailbreaking your analog NT Mini Noir version 2 if you have one. I swear, it's just amazing once you can play all of these games at one time on one console with one controller.